Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome. My name is Karen Tucker. I am the Churchill Club CEO. Since 1985, for 24 years, this forum has provided a nonpartisan platform for the free exchange of ideas, presenting people and topics that matter to our economic success um, as Silicon Valley and as a nation. We are a nonprofit organization, and uh, our support comes from corporate members and sponsors and individual members, people just like you. Uh, in, in our country, in this representative democracy, we accept it as given that we all have a voice in self-governance. And it's true, at least for those of us who vote. Uh, but our government doesn't simply represent us as individuals. Businesses, communities, religious groups, and even our patchwork of cultures is also represented and through various means, political action committees, lobbies, congressional committees, and even at the level of the President's Cabinet, which is why I am so pleased to join with TechNet and the Center for Democracy and Technology to present Anish Chopra tonight, the first Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Someone who understands and appreciates the unique culture here in Silicon Valley, our blend of business and technology, of pragmatism and innovation, uh, it's traditional at meetings of the club to mention upcoming programs, uh, but rather than reviewing the list, I'll simply direct you to our website and mention one program that I hope will inspire you to get to know us better and better. Uh, each of you is invited to join us for our members-only program on Monday, September 21st, presenting Oracle CEO Larry Ellison in conversation with former Motorola CEO Ed Zander. Please visit churchillclub.org for more information. And now it's my pleasure to call forward Jim Dempsey of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Thank you, Karen, and uh, good evening, everybody. I couldn't be more pleased uh, than to be here tonight on behalf of CDT to welcome Anish uh, Chopra to this a meeting of the Churchill Club, co-sponsored as well by TechNet. You know, we've been saying for a long time that what's going on back in D.C. affects your business here in Silicon Valley, and what you do here affects really the critical issues facing our nation. If you, if you go down the list of the, the, the issues, and challenges that are, are being faced. Economic development, obviously. Health care reform has a significant IT component. The environment and the green tech uh, movement. Energy, uh, specifically, and uh, the IT role in smart grids. Education. Government reform itself, an issue that is uh, one of the uh, special interests of our uh, speaker this evening. Anish Chopra uh, clearly understands technology. We clearly have an administration that understands uh, and appreciates technology, as ex exemplified by, among other things, the appointment of Anish and others to advise the president on tech policy issues. So we've been talking for a long time about the need to build a bridge between Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. I think it's fair to say that the bridge has been built. It's now up to all of us to utilize that. Uh, clearly, Anish will say that he needs you. Uh, you, you need him in, in many ways in terms of helping create the policy environment for innovation. And this is a beginning, I think, of an opportunity to build a dialogue to hear what he has to say. He's here very much to hear what you have to say. He's in a position to take the message back to Washington and to have it heard. So that's what this evening is all about, and it's going to be uh, a, an excellent opportunity for dialogue. I want to turn now just briefly to Jim Hawley, the acting CEO of TechNet, who will introduce 
Anish Chopra. Jim, thank you. On behalf of TechNet, the bipartisan political network of CEOs that promotes the growth of the America's innovation economy, it's my great pleasure to be here tonight with our terrific co-hosts, the Churchill Club and the Center for Democracy and Technology, to welcome our keynote speaker, Anish Chopra, Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Before I introduce Anish, I'd like to thank our TechNet team of Betsy Mullins, Katie Hayes, and Jim Hawk of 463 Communications, and many others for helping to pull together tonight's event. TechNet's mission is simple, to ensure that our nation's leaders recognize innovation as the central driver of U.S. economic growth. This means strengthening investments in research and development and deployment, improving our education system to create the next generation of innovators, furthering broadband deployment, and spurring green technologies and job growth. There's no doubt in my mind that this agenda has no stronger friend than Anish Chopra. Anish is a visionary leader with whom we've been honored to work and partner. Anish was an outside advisor to the Obama campaign on, on technology issues. Formerly, before that, he was Virginia's Secretary of, of Technology, where he won accolades for his effective leveraging of technology to drive government reform, improve government performance, and spur economic development, especially economic development in the regions of Virginia that most needed it. For his stellar work in Virginia, the National Association of State CIOs ranked Virginia number one in technology management. Government Technology Magazine na named Anish to their 20, top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers for those who set the standard for using technology to improve the functioning of government. Prior to joining Governor Tim Kaine's cabinet in Virginia, Anish served as managing director with the advisory board company, a publicly traded healthcare think tank with 2,500 hospitals and health systems. He led the firm's financial leadership council and assisted the launch of the firm's first business intelligence software solution. Anish graduated with a master's in public policy from Harvard in 1997. He graduated with a BA from the Johns Hopkins University in 1994. TechNet, our co-founder, John Doerr, hit the nail on the head when he said that Anish Chopra was, and I quote, an inspired appointment by President Obama. We agree wholeheartedly. We look forward to working with him in the months and years ahead to utilize the power of innovation to help all of our people Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Anish Chopra, America's first Chief Technology Officer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am really thrilled to be here. Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, the Churchill Club, CDT, and TechNet for arranging my visit. It's been a wonderful day and a half since I've been here in the Valley. And what I want to convey to you up front is that this will be the first of many visits. Uh, and even if we cannot physically be together, uh, I intend to be with you by phone, by conference call, by other means, so that we can continue the dialogue that we're going to start tonight. In that spirit, I will spend half my time today providing for you some introductory remarks to frame what I do and how I serve uh, President Obama. And then I want to reserve the other half of the time to engage with you in some questions and answers so that we have a chance to hear directly from your ideas and that I may respond appropriately to the questions that you have in front of you. Before we get into the official remarks, let me just sort of set the stage with a little bit of the context for why we are where we are. It is an incredible story to be told about how the American people have embraced a digital life. Today, more Americans have cell phones than washing machines. We are consuming bandwidth and ever-increasing limits. My wife and I uh, moved from Richmond, where I was serving in the governor's cabinet, about a, an hour and a half north to Washington, D.C., the suburbs. And in that move, I experienced firsthand this notion of the kind of uh, bandwidth consumption patterns that we're seeing as Americans. Uh, my cell phone usage prior to this move was largely voice. But at the time when my wife and I were separate, because I was living five days a week during the transition, uh, I was, uh, uh, my wife would take pictures of our six-month-old daughter and our two-and-a-half-year-old daughter and would picture mail me milestones 
so I would consume more data. And as we follow the story even further, we recognize that as we've embraced more and more of this digital life, you and I together as Americans are consuming a little under a gigabit of data every month. The projections are that we'll see that grow fivefold by 2013. So we're still in the early stages of this digital era. We presume most of that will be fueled by internet video. But there, are, there will be so many more applications that we yet to know that will help to move that number even higher still. We're seeing the same type of uh, hyper growth, if you will, in private sectors of our economy. Again, reflecting on my personal life, my youngest daughter is still in her diapers. I had the pleasure of dining with the chief technology officer at Procter & Gamble to talk about the fact that my, my kid loves Pampers. And we were talking about the diapers, and he said, yeah, there are about 10 million diapers, uh, disposable diapers in the United States market. But there are over 130 million around the world that still use cloth diapers. And the CEO of Procter & Gamble challenged the, te the technology officer and his team, and they challenged him in the following way. Engineer a diaper, a disposable diaper, that costs no more than an egg in any country in which we choose to operate. They harness the power and potential of all of this technology and innovation to deliver the magic Knickers product, which is now making inroads around the world. And we're also seeing this in our personal lives in the context of addressing our daily travails. My final personal story about my family, and then I'll move into my, my agenda. My wife and I, in moving from, Northern, from Richmond to Northern Virginia, decided to transition our two and a half year old daughter from the crib to a big girl bed in her own room. And as we made that transition, she realized that she had a lot of freedom. So she could walk out in the bed in the middle of the night and come into our room, and all night we'd have to get up to Brocker, bring her back to the room. My initial instinct was, why don't we just lock the door so she'll stay in the room? <laughs> but using the power of technology and available to us, my wife would immediately went online, found some incredible advice uh, sites, and found out exactly the right intervention that we've now used successfully for several weeks. The point is, we're harnessing all of this technology and innovation in our personal lives. The problem is that we have not translated this in our, com our global competitiveness and our public policy. So I want to bring attention to you on the material behind me, a little bit of, 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 of challenging news. It starts with the story in February of this past year when Rob Atkinson, the, uh, pr the head of the in IT and Innovation Foundation, published a report called The Atlantic Century, benchmarking America against 39 other countries on up to 25 measures of global competitiveness. The purpose of his study was to figure out whether or not we're making progress. Are we in a challenging environment? Are we at the top of our game? When you look at the static measures, the 25 that he looked at, we actually score fairly well. On a number of the dimensions, we're, we're relatively at the top of our game. But he decided to, conduct, uh, to cut the data slightly differently. From the period of time 1999 to 2009, he looked at those same 25 benchmarks and he said, what was the rate of progress? And he benchmarked all 40 countries to say, how, how much have they improved on these indicators? And shocking, he found that the United States ranked dead last amongst the 40 countries in the rate of change. Now, you would presume that when you're at the top of your game, you're marginally improving. So you would, come to, you would come to understand that there are a number of people that are following beneath you that have a higher trajectory. But I want to highlight two areas that just sort of brought home this message of the need for recapturing that spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship within the public policy domain. First, you could see the notion here of e-government. Measured from 2005 to 2008, the United States actually declined in the benchmark index, 7%. While we were ranked number one or number two in the rate of our e-government at the static level, we were again dead last for those who benchmarked on e-government. The countries that were just adjacent to us on numbers one, three, and four, all were seeing near double-digit growth rates in their performance. Similarly, President Obama has said that there's no single contributor to long-term economic success in this country than ensuring we have a high-quality workforce, 
By the way, every time I sit down with a CEO, whether it be a technology company or any other, the number one issue they raise is how we can attract top talent. And as you think about the American capacity for producing top talent, you look at the ratio of our adult population that have college degrees, two or four year degrees. In the education parlance, you'll call this the educational attainment rate. And once again, for decades, America had been the number one country in the world. We are number one no longer. Depending on how you score this, we are eight, nine, or 10. But in the ITIF report, benchmarking the rate of change from 1999 to 2005, we saw a very modest 3% improvement rate. Not only at that trajectory were we not going to get back to number one, we were going to go in the opposite direction. Countries all around us were investing heavily in upskilling their workforce. So you can see, while my personal life was uh, reflective of the work that you and I have lived by, which is that we're harnessing all of these capabilities, in our public policy, we have challenge. It is for this reason that President Obama declared his intention to name a chief technology officer in the White House so that we can ensure that on the big issues that we confront as a nation, the voice of technology and innovation will be heard so that we can correct some of these challenges. So let me share with you a little bit about how we look at these challenges uh, from the perspective of the agenda uh, brought forth by my capacity as serving in chief technology officer role. My job when I wake up in the morning and I go to bed at night is essentially to do two things. Primarily, my job is to advise the president on matters of interest, both in terms of technology policy, but also in terms of how technology can be unleashed to advance other priorities. But I do that in two ways. First, my job is to make sure that we have the right public policy decision making for the long term. What are the right decisions that we can make that over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years will position us for success? And a lot of this is what you'll see caught up in public policy issues. There may be congressional legislation. There may be other uh, forms of, of, of regulatory uh, intervention. But that's to set the foundation to get the long term policies right. But I'm equally interested in what we can do in 60 days, in 90 days, in six months to demonstrate progress against these longer term objectives. And it is that balance between long term policy making and near term activity that I want to present to you as the framework for how I wish to support you and support the president. So what, it is, what is it that the chief technology officer is focused on so that you get a sense for where my priorities are in serving our president? They are applying those principles across three dimensions. First, and most obvious to this community, how can we invest in the building blocks of innovation? Government is best when it sets the rules and ensures that there's a fair level playing field and allows the marketplace to deliver the results we expect of it. So what are those building blocks of innovation? We see them in three ways. Ensuring we have smart, secure infrastructure, focusing on ways in which we can harness our $150 billion research and development budget to bring innovation through the research and development apparatus. And third, making sure that we have a 21st century workforce, the people infrastructure that I just referenced. In this case, focusing on science, technology, engineering, and math as key foundation areas for the next generation workforce. Second. We are focusing on promoting innovation against the president's national priorities. And if you look at the priorities of this administration, they are obvious. The president's been very clear that our top priority is to fix our health care system. And we have an active and vigorous debate in Washington right now on how we go about delivering the promise of health reform. We are also focused on energy independence. And in the technology context, that is the deployment of a smart grid all across the country. And then last but not least, the president's talked about modernizing our educational system. And our priority here is to make sure that we are leveraging technology to advance the education agenda. Last but not least, we must make sure that in public policy, we eat our own proverbial dog food. That if we think it's important to spur innovation, 
writ large across the country, that we must embrace the principles of innovation in our own operations. This is the President's Open Government Initiative, and it is my responsibility to ensure that we are championing the principles of transparency, participatory democracy, and collaboration into the DNA of government operations. And to help support that, we are provisioning a set of platforms uh, that I'll be talking about momentarily. This is a fairly robust agenda. And the levers we deploy against this agenda are as follows. While there's a lot of work to be done, our most appropriate level of influence is on the following manner. One, how can we support a collaborative approach to standards that will ensure that we have the kind of level playing field to deliver that type of game-changing innovation? Whereas it, there's an active work uh, taking place right now to develop standards in healthcare and on the energy sector, but we see this as an opportunity in a number of dimensions. The second, as I referenced earlier, the research and development area, how do we leverage the research and development investments to bring a higher focus on commercialization and the ability to bring value uh, in areas that are critical to this country? And then last but not least, we as a nation spend nearly $75 billion on information technology just within the federal government itself. How do we ensure that our procurement or acquisition strategies help to further the cause as opposed to hinder the cause? That is, how do we leverage our buying power to promote game-changing innovation as opposed to stifling it with the challenges we have all come to know in how we do what we do? I'm going to spend a couple of minutes to give you an example of what these issues mean. Uh, I see a dear friend of mine in the audience, Morgan Paul, who's with the CK12 Foundation, just to give you a flavor for what we mean by balancing a long-term policy interest with the need for short-term uh, deliverables. I'm going to talk about this in the context of education technology, so you see how these things come together. The President in the Economic Stimulus Package has included nearly $650 million to help wire up through our K-12 system with education technology funding. That money is uh, in, in process to be distributed around the country. In fact, there was an announcement with Secretary Arne Duncan and the President earlier uh, this month highlighting this amongst a variety of initiatives to transform our educational system more generally. We will have in the education technology space a lot of debate about what people are buying, what I referred to as the nouns. And there's a lot of debate about what the nouns should be for us to engage in education. Should we be buying electronic whiteboards, laptops for kids, ebook readers? Again, the nouns to occupy a great deal of the policy debate. But in the short run, our focus must also be on the verbs. How do we utilize technology to actually transform the way we deliver information to our kids and support learning? So I'll share with you the story of the verb in the context of my relationship with Morgan as an example for how uh, we see these as opportunities for improvement. When I was in uh, Virginia, Secretary of Technology's role in Virginia under Governor Kane, we identified our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics areas as a priority. The governor dispatched a set of uh, volunteer scientists and engineers to kick the tires on our science standards panel, that is the content that we make available in our classrooms. Like every state in the country, we go through a five or seven year process to revise our uh, standards. And in the Virginia context, uh, our physics standards in particular, according to our expert panel, left a lot of room for improvement. While we had been very well regarded for having standards that were of high quality by peer review organizations, um, our, our physicists would tell us, gosh, you still say that the main component of a television is the cathode ray tube. Where are my CNET people in the house? Is that true? Of course not. However, we were thinking about this issue in the long run. In the Virginia story, it was 2007-ish. We got a report that said, let's modernize the standard for physics. The physics standard itself was going to be reviewed in 2009, fiscal 2009, I guess the calendar year 2009, to have it be revised. That meant it would have been engaging with the textbook industry in 2010, which meant that the schools would be buying those textbooks in 2011. So imagine sitting in 2007 with a report 
that says the main component of a television is a cathode ray tube, knowing that you cannot change it until 2011 in terms of kind of on the ground reality. So the notion of bringing technology and innovation to drive performance, this is the story of where Murrigan shows up and said, we met in, a, in July, and he said, look, we've got an open platform, uh, kind of the foundation of a wiki, if you will, that allows you to help co-create uh, content that might fill some of these content gaps in the area of physics. We had no money. So by July, went into August, we said, let's do a project together. By September, Governor Kane says, hey, I'd love to uh, invite any scientist in the country, mostly in Virginia, but anybody in the country who wishes to contribute chapters to our physics project. We have no money, but we'd certainly welcome your participation. Uh, Tom Merritt and uh, company at uh, CNET were kind enough to reference this in their uh, Buzz Out Loud podcast. And folks from all over the country said, hey, yeah, sign us up. Not paying me for some content? Great. I'm there. <laughs> and we assembled about uh, maybe 15 or 16 world-class folks. We had college professors. We had teachers in the classroom. We had high school students wishing to volunteer. And this merry band of brothers said, let's harness the power of technology and innovation and by December, they had their first draft of chapters written. Ten chapters went through a review process through January and February. March, the governor says, here's version 1.0, available for all the schools in Virginia, frankly, anyone in the country to consume. And by uh, April, we had school districts in Virginia say they were going to evaluate that content, chapters on modeling and simulation, on dark energy, on uh, you name it, all to be considered in the fall. So here we went from four years to get the standards and the process and the procurement to less than 12 months from concept to in the classroom you'll have new information available for students. That is the spirit of marrying the long-term policy goals, which is how do you drive more support for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, with how do you embrace these technologies to dr deliver value in the here and the now. We did not need new laws to pursue this initiative. We didn't need any new budgets. We didn't need any new framework. We obviously needed to harness the leadership capacity of the public sector to embrace this and to move it forward. But that is the same spirit we need to bring to each of these dimensions, whether it be on our broadband infrastructure, whether it be in our, our approach to commercializing university intellectual property to spur the jobs of the future, whether it be transforming our healthcare system to reward wellness and, and early care as opposed to the system that rewards mostly the work we do to address sickness. These are all capabilities for which my friends in this community have a voice to be, to be heard that describes what the long-term policy framework should be, but also what we could do in the here and the now. In just the last five hours, in the handful of meetings that we've held already, I've come away with a half dozen ideas that could be executed in the next 90 days. Our challenge is to prioritize and deliver value for the president. Now, this all sounds well and good, you might say. Mr. CTO, thank you for coming and introducing yourself to the Silicon Valley. Uh, we're going to have some conversation momentarily where you're going to tell me your thoughts and, and your perspectives. But this, this all still sounds sort of at the highest levels. What are you doing in the here and the now? You've been in the job now since May 22nd when you were sworn in. It is now July. It is now August. It is now August 4th. <laughs> I, have no, I have no sense of days anymore, my, my, my challenge. What have you done for us lately? So I want to end with a little bit of where we are and what we're doing. So we, again, want to balance this notion of the long term with the short run. That's my boss in that picture over there. You may see him. His name is Barack Obama. He's celebrating his 48th birthday today. And uh, you can see that he is online personally validating an initiative uh, led by my dear, dear friend, the Chief Information Officer Vivek Kundra, who is my partner on transforming the way our government operates. And what on earth is he doing online? On June 30, we announced, again, with very little investment, with no new laws, with no new framework for public policy, we asked the very simple question. You as American taxpayers, how much information do you have on the 75, 76 billion dollars you as taxpayers spend on information technology? It helps that the president, when he was in the Senate, championed the website, usaspending.gov, to allow us to say, let's create it.usaspending.gov. And so we announced a groundbreaking approach to transparency 
and openness so that you, the American people, could see how well your taxpayer dollars, or not so well, they're performing with respect to information technology investments. Wouldn't you know it, 30 million people have visited this site in just the last month or so. But here's the real point of where we're delivering value in the here and the now. I, you can't really see this because it's hard to read it, but I wanted to highlight for you the leadership from General Shinseki, our Secretary for the Department of Veterans Affairs. The General wants to lead an organization that's built for success. He wants to deliver tremendous value. But his internal, he, he asked his CIO, a dear friend of mine, Roger Baker, I want you to conduct a top to bottom assessment of our IT projects, and I want you to tell me whether we're doing the right thing, the wrong thing, and so forth. Can you believe this? General Shinseki, Secretary Shinseki, has asked that 45 projects be halted because of the internal assessment. Okay, yeah, Tim, yes, give him a shout out. It's the reason why he did so was because he asked the tough questions. And what we did is to support General Shinseki, Secretary Shinseki, to bring his information to the American taxpayer and to challenge all other secretaries in the, in the president's cabinet to do the same thing. CIOs all over the federal government started saying, oh my goodness, my cabinet secretary is calling me in for meetings. I have to explain what I'm doing. That's a good thing because it starts to bring some rigor to how we evaluate our performance. And I need to earn my stripes with you that we are setting forth the right policies and we're demonstrating that we're, we're actually delivering on what we're saying. And so I give a big shout out to my friend Vivek for building this system in his capacity as CIO since he's responsible for managing that $76 billion IT portfolio. But the point is that we are starting to create a culture of accountability through information transparency. In addition to this, we also recognize that for many of you in this room that have developed innovations, it's not the easiest thing in the world to bring those innovations to federal government. How many of you tried to respond to an RFP with 5,000 detailed requirements when you knew your intervention could be done with pennies on the dollar? This is the challenge that we're confronting in the right now. My dear friend Vivek and I are going through a litany of open government platforms, that is tools that we can provision so that it's easy for the federal agencies to consume them just as it's as easy for you and me to set up a Facebook account or a Twitter account or you name it. If it's as easy for each of us to consume this in our personal lives, it should be just as easy for our agencies to consume them in our professional lives. So all the work about professionalizing our security tools, making sure that they're following protocol, let's organize that work up front so that it doesn't have to be replicated hundreds of times across the federal government. So your input would be welcome, but we are focused on wikis, blogs, open peer review platforms, open grant making platforms, a public engagement platform, a product innovation challenges platform, as well as mapping and visualization tools, and that list will continue to grow. So we'd welcome your feedback and making sure that we can provision them in a way that delivers high value. But I want to end my remarks with just two more slides, and that is we must deliver on the promise. So again, what are we doing in the here and the now? June 25th, just over a month on the job, the president calls me, the CIO, and our chief performance officer, what we're calling our management C-suite. He calls on us to say the following. We have a, a challenge in our citizenship and immigration service. I don't know how many of you had to go through this process. Uh, customer friendly perhaps may not be at the top of your list of words <laughs> to express how this, relation, this agency operates. But the people who are there are absolutely committed to customer service. They're hungry for it. They're ex 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 attempting to, whenever they're, whenever they're possible way, to make it a little bit more customer friendly. But we've not found a way to ask the simple question. What can we do in 90 days to demonstrate meaningful progress that we wish to be more customer friendly? So the three of us work closely with the Citizenship and Immigration Service. And I can assure you, the president put us on the spot. In the next 90 days, USCIS will launch a vastly improved website that will, for the first time ever, allow applicants to get their updates, basically like Burger King, have it your way. You can get it by text message. 
You can get it by email, and you can get it by visiting us online. More to the point, we've opened up the kimono to say this is how many steps there are for you to get a green card or whatever it is you're getting. So it's not a black box to say yes, no. It's here's, here's where you are in the queue. And here's how long you wait in this phase of the queue if you are in the New York office or the Philly office or the Chicago office, benchmarking it so you can see all that data. And then here's the next step in the queue, and then here's the next step in the queue. The point is, we can deliver this. Anybody want to know how much money we're spending on this above and beyond our, our budget? Zero. The point is, we are doing this within our capacity and our resources. We're reallocating. We're going after the things that are higher priority. This will be live, or I will have a lot to answer to for my boss, by September 22nd, at the end of that 90-day process. So we're trying to deliver on the promise of how we demonstrate the value of technology and innovation. But, and now I've gone over my, my, my remark time, but I want to end with this notion. I come from Virginia. I am a Virginian. Virginia is a commonwealth. It is not a state. And I want to explain to you why that's relevant in the context of our friends here in Silicon Valley. We visited, we hosted the Queen, very special affair, in 2007 when we celebrated the 400th anniversary of the birthplace of Jamestown. And at that time, we reflected on America as a commonwealth from the embodiment of the, the, the initial settlers into Jamestown. And the idea of commonwealth is that we often come together, yes, we do, to pass laws and we have legislatures and so forth, but more often than not, we just come together as family, as friends, as neighbors, because we want to make our lives just a little bit better we don't need laws to invite your support for our CK-12 initiative that, that Morgan helped me launch. We don't need laws to engage in areas that deliver value for the American people. I end with these two final stories because this really is at the heart of why we need you. We need to embrace this spirit of commonwealth. The idea that we can bring the power of entrepreneurship to deliver game-changing innovation in our public services. I'll tell you the story of David Green, a social entrepreneur in Baltimore, Maryland, who was frustrated that the market cost for hearing aids was too high. It was inaccessible for the 240 million people around the world who suffer from hearing loss but cannot access the technology because it's costly. In public policy, we engage on this issue by subsidizing that cost. We will have a debate. Who will pay for the hearing aids? It's a moral outrage that this is not happening. And so we'll say, OK, let's fund it, but let's not fund it. Let's use the buying power of government to bring the price down from x dollars to maybe x minus 10% because of procurement. Rarely do we have in our body politic the discussion that says, why does it have to cost that much in the first place? David Green fundamentally re-engineered the hearing aid, much like my friends at Procter & Gamble with the disposable diapers, and he's produced a prototype in three years that might cost as little as $60 in the field. Ditto my friend Abul Hassam, a George Mason professor, a government employee, I might add, who said, I as a child drank arsenic-laced water in Bangladesh. Market solutions for removing arsenic from the water might cost up to $5,000 and require uh, energy that's not available in those villages. And again, the public policy might debate the subsidy to make that happen. But he said, we've got to find a better way. With some seed capital from his boss, another government employee, for $10,000, he experimented. I, I joked that he went to Walmart, bought some buckets, put some sand in it, added a chemical compound, and out comes this, this contraption that's pictured here. Dirty water up top, clean water out, all in. Retail costs $40, five-year maintenance free. It's that spirit of commonwealth that we can come together and tackle the big issues. Who in this room is going to tackle the big issues to return our nation to a focus on prevention and wellness in our healthcare environment? to make sure that we can be more energy independent, to make sure that our kids can learn the 4,000 words they have to know before they enter school, because you figured out a way to embed them into videos or other things, because you believe we need to work together to solve these challenges. We may do this through government contract, but more often than not, you'll do it with each other. That's the spirit. That is why I'm so honored to be with you today. And that's what I'm hoping over the coming months and years as we work together, we can demonstrate more wins on the scoreboard and show the value to the American people of why 
all of this matters in their lives. Thank you for hearing me out. I'm happy to take questions, comments, or concerns. Behind you. Right behind you. Right there behind you. Or you first. Yes, sir. And tell Hi. us your name. Uh, Robert Mullins. I'm with examiner.com. Yes, sir. Um, one of the initiatives President Obama has touted often is the uh, digi digitization of medical records yes, sir. as part of health care reform. But there's some resistance in the industry. Uh, some doctors get, you know, you know, used to paper files and also serious concerns about privacy and security and legislation such as HIPAA that imposes restrictions on how health professionals can share information. How do you square the two and achieve that digitization of medical records and uh, address those concerns? It's actually a, a very similar challenge as the, the question was around the relationship between digital records uh, balanced against the security and privacy framework uh, and concerns. The President was very clear in his statement in May when announcing our cybersecurity strategy that we as a nation have both a challenge to keep the openness of the Internet to, to support the culture of innovation that we've seen uh, all across not just the Valley but other parts of the country as well in terms of spurring uh, game-changing uh, ideas and products and services, while at the same time we have a real uh, and, and growing cybersecurity threat. The President's remarks there really affect this question on health care. It is not a question of one or the other. That becomes a false choice. The question is, if we get the cybersecurity framework right, it could fuel the next wave of growth on the Internet infrastructure. I would say the same is true in healthcare. If we get the security and privacy aspects right and instill the kind of confidence the American people have that, in fact, it will be secure and used in the right way, I think it will fuel a wide-ranging uh, set of product innovations that will at least inspire the consumer market to ask for more than they are today, because there is legitimate concern. But more often than not, the challenge is, I would say, there's two more things I would say to your, your remarks. Number one, the President's also been clear that we need fundamental payment reform as a component of our migration towards digital health. That is, if our system today rewards sickness and care, it doesn't really help that you do an electronic visit or text message the, the pregnant mother who you're trying to keep on prenatal care so that she avoids a preterm uh, a birth. So the incentives are not today designed to encourage that type of front end prevention and wellness activity. So as the president has said very clearly, as we shift, again, health reform is the key, ladies and gentlemen. If we get health reform through, it will allow us to create a market incentive to promote that kind of wellness and care, which hopefully, when coupled with security and privacy uh, protections and, and instilling confidence, could spur a new wave of innovation to deliver on this. In fact, that was a large part of the discussion I had this afternoon on what just some of the ideas that are cooking in this community uh, to get it done. I will make one final observation. Many people say in healthcare, well, the physicians don't like technology. Let me share with you this story. There isn't a doctor in America that I know today who has not downloaded a copy of a product called Hippocrates. Ask your local doctor, do you have Hippocrates? It is healthcare IT. It is a tool that allows them to make better judgments about your medical, your medication usage. And it's an accessible format. And they all have found a way to adopt it and use it. They have it on their trios, their Blackberries, their iPhones. And uh, that, that gives me confidence that if we built better products and got the payment incentives right, you're going to see game-changing innovation. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm violating the rules. OK, ladies first, well, man. OK, the lady, go ahead. Can, lady can go first. That's OK with me. You have the mic now. Go ahead. Thank you. OK, Mr. Shepa, thank you. I'm Chris Primesberger. I cover, e, um, I cover IT for eWeek. You mentioned uh, briefly in your remarks that you came up with, a, or you found a, about a half a dozen ideas just recently. Uh, can you share some of those with us, or is it too early for that? Well, uh, what I don't want to do is commit to the ideas being implemented. So I'd like to thoughtfully uh, uh, you know, absorb the meetings. Basically, what I'm trying to do right now is listen. So there are people who have ideas that 
I hope have been a part of the public policy debate for years. I just don't know the history. But at least from my vantage point, tell me what I can be doing to make sure that we're following the right policy goals and give me the right ideas that we can deliver in the next 60 to 90 days. So I'm kind of asking both questions. And I'm getting a lot of very helpful feedback. My job is to go back, absorb this, work with my team, re-engage, and make sure that we're uh, putting forward a right agenda for, for success. But I will certainly be back with ideas. Let me go to the man over here. Uh, good evening. Dr. Donna Schaefer. I'm a professor of IT at Marymount University in Arlington, Hey, Virginia. I live a mile from you. <laughs> yes. Um, what are you doing here? I spend the summers here to get away from the humidity. Oh. <laughs> um, I teach undergrads information technology. So what kind of values uh, should I start to instill in them for this productive, innovative, competitive uh, future that we're all hoping for? My number one message to technology workers is we must listen, listen, listen for customer need. Probably the biggest role I play in, in, in the work that we do on a daily basis is that the IT people speak French and the quote unquote business people speak English and we lose a lot in translation. It's why we have the 2,000 requirements in government and the mess and the fight and the project is not working and it's not getting to where you want to be. In large part, it's because we don't listen very well for what the true business need is. And uh, yes, the customer needs to speak better about their needs, but we also have to be ask better questions. So for those of you that are teaching IT, probably the coolest thing you could do is put your folks through what's called customer experience design workshops, where you can actually listen and prototype. You like that? Amen, sister. Uh, where you can basically design, you can better design uh, what it is. You can understand better what the customer's true needs are, even if they can't articulate them. But I'm, I'm trying philosophically to embed customer experience training more in depth in, term the, in terms of the federal workforce. Yes, sir. Yes, Jim Fruchterman from Benetech. Um, from Silicon Valley, we often think great technical ideas go to Washington to die. Ha! And so, Not on my um, watch. And, and it, seriously, and, and, and you know, it's because the procurement process, the yes. decision-making process, isn't oriented towards what costs one-tenth as much per unit of something delivered. Or the, you know, so how are you going to change that culture that keeps the federal government often 10, 15 years behind the times? There are, there are agencies that are 20 years behind the times, as you probably know. What are you going to do to change that so that some of these great ideas like David Green's or their equivalent would actually make penetration in Washington? Short, medium, and long term. Short term, there are tools today in Washington that you all don't utilize very well that actually cut through a lot of the challenge you're describing. And so communicating better the tools that are available. I'll give you an example. The Defense Department has a website called defensesolutions.gov, where they have procurement authority to solve, to take any idea that's presented in like a half a page and turn that into a process that will ultimately lead to a purchasing decision. So they have a simple request online right now. I call it CSI Baghdad. It's basically they want a ruggedized forensics kit to be used in a battlefield setting. And they ex explain in some verbiage about what that means. So literally anyone in the valley could visit defensesolutions.gov, present the idea, and the idea itself is sufficient to get through the procurement process. That's category A, use the tools better. Category B is to push a little bit on the envelope for some of the other tools. We have X prizes and other uh, capabilities to do challenges that will bring game-changing innovation to Washington. We haven't really embrace them in all the areas that we could. So we're actively in, in discussions inside the White House to see how do we bring more uh, challenges, prizes, and so forth. We're experimenting right now with paying $2,500 $2, for the best YouTube video on uh, H1N1 you know, public announcements or whatever. But that's a small thing. But we're going to try to make it bigger. And then the third long-term policy question is, we do need procurement reform. It's been a priority of the president's. It is not easy, but we have leadership at the Defense Department looking to pursue this, which is a big part of our buying power, and other agencies are looking to follow suit. So your voice needs to be heard on the broader debate of, of, of procurement reform. My job is to get you in the first two categories that don't require a change in law. Let me turn to this side. Oh. 
I think. Or I think anyone I have, else? Yes, sir. I have the mic. Hi, Whoever I'm, has the mic, I guess I'm not going to call the names. Hi, I'm Tony Wasser. I'm at Carnegie Mellon in Silicon Valley and uh, have a little research group around open source. Um, when we try to do innovation, uh, at some point you run up against some of the existing installed software, and we know that a, really? lot of, a lot of the software in the government is ripe for replacement. It's built on old technology. Really? Yeah. I'm telling you things you, you don't know, right? Um, but it was over time. It's over budget. It's held together with chewing gum and bailing wire. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if in this whole list of things you've had to do so far and with your new uh, child, uh, whether you've begun to look at some of these troubled systems and begun to come up with some uh, strategies to uh, evolve out of them and, and toward more modern technologies and solutions. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I will say this in defense of a number of the agencies. There actually are some reasonably well-architected solutions that are in pockets in the government. And, and there are some well-intentioned folks that are sort of put in a position to make tough decisions because of the way procurement runs and so forth. I would say this. Uh, it is easier for us to intervene on free tools that are alternatives, so on the increment, Rather than going down a very expensive custom-built X, if we can use open tools to help us deliver value, that we're provisioning now. That's why that slide showed all those platforms we're trying to bring in. So then it becomes professional services acquisition to bring people who can build on those tools. But that's the short, mini-me version. The longer version is, and I'm having this broader debate, I am a big fan of open collaboration, not specific open source. And let me tell you why. I have no problem with people purchasing Oracle or Microsoft or you name it. The challenge for us is that 90 cents on the dollar is spent custom developing on top of that stack. And we're not sharing the intellectual property agency to agency. So in Virginia, when we were adopting a financial system for the transportation department, we have to put in provisions for snowplow accounting they don't come out of the box from the software packages. And so all the cost to put the snowplow accounting module in really have to be repeated in every state. So we're trying to create a culture of shareable intellectual property that would allow agency A and B to foster that kind of environment for sharing. More will be done there, but that is not an easy problem to solve. Uh, Mike, next Mike. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Cassidy Zerer. I work with New Mark Knight Frank. Uh, Mr. Chopra, thank you very much for Anish, joining us. Yes. Um, when Bill Gates spoke at the TED convention, uh, he talked about integrating a very simple technology into education, uh, whereby they'd videotape some of the best performing teachers in the country and upload those onto the internet, making them widely available for any students if they missed a class because they were sick or they were falling behind. Um, and I'm just curious to know if you've given that any thought about implementing such a system for the public schools, and um, if so, how, how, that, how you might see that playing out. Under Secretary Duncan's leadership, we are going after a game-changing innovation in our schools. We have a race to the top fund, nearly $5 billion that we will use as a catalyst to bring change to our locals. My, uh, my activity there is to partner with the Office of Educational Innovation, my good friend Jim Shelton, and to put together a portfolio of initiatives, short, medium, and long term, that will do exactly as you're describing. We have a candidate menu that's fairly deep right now, and we're working down that list to harmonize a plan for education technology. When we go through that process, uh, I will be delighted to share uh, that activity. But rest assured, professional development and simple strategies that you're describing are part of the low-hanging fruit. I'll give you an example of low-hanging fruit. Uh, when I was in Virginia, the folks that were in adult education, they do uh, GED classes, they have VHS tapes for the uh, uh, GED classes, and they are on VHS because they were in the 1970s or something when they actually filmed them. If you look at them, they're kind of old. The question that came up when I saw, I was with the superintendent of education, I said, geez, how do people get this stuff? Well, you have to call in and ask for a copy of the tapes, and it's kind of annoying. And so we just said, OK, this is silly. Why don't we call the cable companies, Cox and Comcast? One phone call, they both said, hey, We'll set up an on-demand channel for free that we'll call GED On Demand. They uploaded the videos in about a month, month and a half to make sure the file formats were right. And 6,000 people downloaded the classes with no money, no marketing budget, no expense, no big deal, all in a matter of weeks and months. 
because of what you're describing. There's some simple stuff we can do that doesn't require nuclear war things to be done. Let's get those done. And that's a lot of what I'm hoping will be in the balanced portfolio. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. My name is Claire Baldwin. I'm from Reuters. And earlier you were talking about how if we could really nail cybersecurity, it would spur significant innovation. Yes, ma'am. But given the recent resignation of Melissa Hathaway, a, is the U.S. doing enough to address the cybersecurity issue? B, um, are you offering incentives to certain companies? If so, how much? Or if you're not, are you planning to do so? Great questions. Let me begin by saying, for those of you who don't follow the news, my very dear friend, Melissa Hathaway, who's been working 24 hours a day, seven days a week with family on cybersecurity issues, uh, announced today that she will be resigning at the uh, mid to late August. Uh, she's been in, the, in an acting capacity uh, pending the president's national search for a cybersecurity coordinator, a position that he announced in May would be critical in his administration. When he made the announcement that we would create a cybersecurity coordinator, he was explicit that he has asked that cybersecurity coordinator to work very closely with me, to work with the private sector in a collaborative spirit, and Vivek Kundra, our CIO, who would work to bring cybersecurity policies in line with our federal government uh, IT capacity. Despite Melissa's uh, resignation, we are, been, we are working fast and furious. Five days after the president's announcement, I was in New York City with leading representatives of the financial services industry. I am focused on financial services, on energy, and on health care as sectors to collaborate with to address the president's challenge to me. And we are absolutely identifying, I'm having the same conversation that I'm having with you as I had with them. I said, look, we can have a long debate about regulatory review and performance changes, and that's what, let's have that debate. The Treasury Department regulates that sector as an example. But I challenged the banking industry and I said, what can we deliver in 90 days that will demonstrate progress towards our shared vision for cybersecurity? We are well down that path. Hold me accountable by the end of that 90-day mark we'll, to make sure that we're, we're showing progress. Um, I'm hopeful to bring the levers, the tools that we have, which are uh, R&D investment opportunities. Um, there may be some shared procurement opportunities. And again, there may be some collaborative opportunities through standards to bring about uh, better, a better capability. So uh, I am working very closely. I had been with Melissa. I will continue to be while she's there. It's a very, very high priority. We baked into the Smart Grid uh, broadband announcement, I'm sorry, the Smart Grid funding announcement that we would have cybersecurity principles from the very beginning. So we are not stopping just because we are waiting for that, that position to be filled. I appreciate the question. Um, Who else? Yes, sir. Yeah, Carl Hewitt, Emeritus of MIT. There's a conundrum. The more private information I put in the system, the better job it can do for me. I get less irrelevant advertising. It does all these wonderful things. <laughs> On the other hand, when I put my intimate private information into the crowd, it's subject to various abuses of all kinds. You know, subpoenas from divorce lawyers, somebody here who wants to sue me, the security feed, uh, people get to look at it. So how do, we how do we square this circle? Is more government regulation the answer? We have a policy framework around privacy that will be way deep on these issues. Uh, I will not lead our, our debate on privacy because we have those who are thoughtful and engaging on the subject, but I'm very sensitive to uh, the choice. My, my, my bias walking into the room is that consumer preference shall be a leading uh, uh, a driver of policy, and where appropriate, we'll be uh, focusing on how we can ensure that you have the decision making and the authority on what's happening. Uh, how that's manifest and in what capacity uh, all that to be debated as we go through this, uh, uh, this policy framework around privacy, but I, I appreciate the question. Hi, Chris Bethel from Quantros. Yes, sir. Uh, you've talked a lot about uh, health IT, and I think we've got a pretty good sense of the nouns. I'm wondering about the verbs. Yes, sir. As far as healthcare IT, if you could expand on that a bit. I will. So uh, the definition, uh, the two words that matter the most in figuring out the verbs are the words meaningful use. The Congress, uh, in putting in the money, the 20 plus billion dollars in incentives that will go to doctors if they adopt electronic health record systems, requires that doctors demonstrate that they are meaningful users of the technology. That phrase has opened up, first of all, for the folks in Washington who hire you know, firms that come in to talk about these issues, 
no two words has meant more into the healthcare sector from an IT standpoint than meaningful use. So here's the process. Um, there is a set of public committees. I serve on one of the president's public committees, the Standards Committee for Health IT. And uh, you can download online draft versions of what meaningful use should look like as recommended by these presidential advisory committees. And you can see a lot of the verbs that we're talking about. There are verbs about simplifying administrative costs. There are verbs about making sure that you track uh, your prescription usage. There are verbs around making sure that we can identify your cholesterol so that we can see if you know, a doctor has to be able to screen his or her patients to find who needs to be outbound communicated with to make sure they're getting their screenings for, for cancer and so forth. So those, noun, those verbs are listed in a draft document which is available online that reflect, reflects the, the advisory committee's view that goes into the administration and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services will issue a regulation, uh, hopefully by December, if not shortly thereafter, that defines what the ultimate uh, regulated term meaningful use will mean. So there's time right now for you to evaluate what the public, the, the public advisory committees have said and, and give feedback if you think it's insufficient. But that is a wonderful frame around meaningful use that I wish to carry into other disciplines of technology because, again, it's about the demonstrated use of this to deliver value as opposed to the, hey, here's my receipt. I bought some software. It's not being used, but I want my, my check. Yes, oh, who's next? i got to make sure I don't get in trouble. Yes. Hi, I'm Tara LeMay from Lens Ventures, an innovation firm here in San Francisco. I, um, along with Jim Dempsey from CD2, who uh, was one of our hosts, uh, spent the last, I don't know, seven years on the Markle Task Force on National Security and you know, really worked on uh, rethinking the intel after 9-11. So I know how hard your job is trying to change the internal structures. But since then, we got asked by a very large foundation to try to increase um, higher education degrees in the U.S. from 30 percent to 60 percent using venture capital uh, innovation approaches, which we're taking on. I have to tell you, higher ed is harder than national security was. And it's really... I'm going to come back to you on that. I disagree, it, but keep going. It's, well, it's not a technology problem. Um, the, modular, the ability to take courses online, to have modules, to have capabilities is actually pretty easy. We're pretty good at that. But what's really hard is the states um, and the fractured structure. We don't have an interstate highway-like system to allow for the flexibility of uh, accreditation and credential and lifetime accrual of uh, ongoing education. We have these terminal systems that are really done on a regional or local basis. So as you sort of encourage us to be innovative out here, and I think a lot of us are, how can we help break through some of those policy pieces, just like we did on national security, to really try to make that flow happen a little bit differently. This is exactly why we have the leadership and Secretary Duncan to tackle these issues. First and foremost, my, my impression is that the Community College uh, uh, Foundation will probably the most, be the most leveraged opportunity for improving our higher entertainment rate. Community College system is very keen to adopt emerging technologies. In fact, when the President announced maybe a month ago I think we reserved something like $25 million as seed capital to promote distance learning frameworks in the uh, community college space. So that is absolutely on my list of to-dos on behalf of the president so that we get that right. Community colleges are designed to work closely with industry to produce the information needed. So my, my presumption is that as we look at the leverage points to get up the higher entertainment rate, we have limited capacity in the higher ed market from the four-year schools, we have gr greater capacity in the two-year schools. And so I'm, I'm, my hope is that we're going to see pockets of innovation throughout. Follow up? Oh, I understand that. You're saying, allow me to mash up a course from here, a course from there, and a course from there for a degree. OK. I'll take that feedback. I'm not so sure I'm solving that one, but I'll, I'll take that feedback. OK. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Anish. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Jeff Peterson, Target Discovery, um, biotech firm, involved in leadership in the personalized medicine space and so on. Um, uh, first, a, a clarification, perhaps, you can provide for us. 
Um, in addition to Chief Technology Officer, you've referenced a CIO. There's a President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. Yes. There are other roles. Can you just clarify how the pieces fit, where the charters overlap or are yes. directed differently? But my, my core question is really policy in terms of national laboratories. There's an enormous amount of funding that goes into national labs. Uh, at least many would argue that's a bit of a black hole of inefficiency versus private industry. Um, you made some references to the efficiencies of private industry, and if you just get the playing field set right that you want to let industry, consumers, and so on um, drive innovation. Um, you know, arguably there are some tasks so large, fusion energy comes to mind as one that it really needs that kind of governmental centralized approach, but even something like uh, the space program of the 60s today is a private undertaking. Um, so I'm just interested in some thoughts on policy relative to national laboratory expenditures versus redirection of that toward private industry. So let me give you the brief uh, roadmap. The uh, White House for years has had an Office of Science and Technology Policy. In fact, I'm dual-hatted in that I am both the Associate Director for Technology in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as uh, the Assistant to the President and Chief Technology Officer. So what does that mean? That means that, number one, the President has the authority to select his advisors. And so the, the, those who carry the title assistant to the president, there's maybe 25 of them, uh, they, they serve in a capacity to, to make sure that there is uh, the right voice on the issues on a, broad, on a broad range of topics. I hold that role in the dual hat, which means I serve as an assistant to the president in my capacity as chief technology officer. The role I play as the associate director for, Sci for technology in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, as I said to you when I started, technology is always, had historically been, maybe I didn't say it here, technology was often viewed as a box unto itself. Health, education, technology, each had a siloed policy framework. And in that context, R&D had been a vertical discipline that the Office of Science and Technology Policy had guidance on. So the issue of how do we support funding for federal labs, what are the priorities, how does it balance with their portfolio of uh, promoting commercialization activity, looking at basic research, how do they partner, those kinds of issues are, dom are the domain of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, led by my dear friend Dr. John Holdren, a brilliant scientist. Uh, the, uh, the addition the President had done is that all of that in that apparatus was really focused on policy making external to the operations of government. When the, when the president thought about managing the $76 billion in IT, everybody from Silicon Valley and uh, many other pockets of technology said, well, you need to have a CIO to make sure that you're, right, you're, you're governing that spend well. So the president created a, a position in the Office of Management and Budget, which is the vehicle that we use to run an effective government, to create the chief information officer who has an extremely ambitious job, rein in and better manage the $76 billion in spend. We overlap in the president's open government agenda that says bring emerging technologies that are out in Silicon Valley and in other pockets of the country and bring them into that government apparatus that historically had been dealing with the $76 billion. So the two of us partner in support of the President's Open Government Initiative. So anything to do with government reform, bringing in new technologies into Washington and to ensure that they get baked into the operations, we are joined at the hip and partners. It doesn't hurt the fact that we're very close friends. And we're partnered with a third person, the Chief Performance Officer, who's setting outcomes goals for the management of government itself so that when we actually do these types of things, <coughs> they're in support of a broader policy outcome goal. Also doesn't hurt that he was my first boss at the advisory board. So it's a very tight circle. If we weren't all friends, I'm sure things would have been more complicated. Uh, oh. But your last question, that was the other thing. The OSTP framework allows you to get into the R&D question. Hello, this is Robert Scoble from Rackspace's Building 43. Um, I'm noticing a conflict, and it might get to so, some of the conflicts that you're seeing in the, in the education system. And on one side, uh, there's... On one side, there's private industry like Aardvark. There's a company here in San Francisco that's doing some really interesting stuff with Twitter. So you can uh, query Aardvark, um, and it'll give you an answer back. Aardvark? Right? Bark, B-A-R-K, at Bark, uh, okay. right? Got it. 
There's also, uh, on the other side, there's geeks in government who are doing interesting things with Twitter. For instance, the Washington State Department of Transportation, if you're ever driving across one of the borders, uh, like up in Vancouver, you can Twitter to the border crossing and it'll answer back uh, how long the wait is at the border crossing. Huh. And it's really cool. So we have those two forces on one side, but on the other side, we had uh, the military yesterday, the Marines, I believe, say that Twitter is off, off limits to use inside the military. That's sending a, a horrible message, and this is why government takes so long to adopt these new technologies, because now people who are on the sidelines are gonna say, I'm not gonna do anything. It's too scary. There's, the, the Marine says that Twitter is bad. You know, this geek in Washington State Department of Transportation says it's good, but I'm not gonna listen to that guy. I'm gonna listen to the Marines, and I'm just gonna stop, and I'm not gonna innovate. How do you solve that problem? Well, I don't solve the military's personal decision to, 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 uh, to, to balance their security requirements. Um, I, I would say this. The, the purpose behind that open government platform that I was referencing was to sort of simplify the provisioning of these tools in an environment that's safe and secure. Call it our government cloud computing strategy, if you will. And so that's not ready yet. So when it is ready and we announce it and we're ready to organize who's in and who's out in the process, my presumption is you'll see a lot more in than out and it'll be safe and secure and provisioned in a manner that would allow uh, its use. So recognize that for, for individual decisions in the, in the for crying out loud, in the White House itself, I can't access hardly anything, okay? <laughs> to be very frank with you, just up, up until a month ago, I had such a poor browser that when I wanted to go visit my mint.com to go through my financials or whatever, it would say, this browser is so old, I can't use it. <laughs> that, that is the environment we're in because the technology infrastructure are, are as they are. And I'm, you know, those things will happen over time. I'm not gonna get hung up on fixing the challenging environment. I'm gonna stand up a safe environment that we can bring those ideas in and that will, I hope, bring uh, answers to the question. Hi, Anish. Oh, I got, uh, we're, getting the, uh, we're getting the heave ho here. So you Anish. are the honorable last, last uh, question. Forgive oh, me, good. I'll hang actually, out for a little bit. We'll reception. Hi, Anish, I'm Tad Bogdan. And actually, it's the last question. I'm gonna bring up the question about the first goal listed on your bio, and that's what you're going to do about job creation. Yes, sir. I've been here in Silicon Valley for 30 years, worked with startups, co-founded companies, and never in the 30 years have I known more people who have been out of work. So the question is, what are you going to do to help stimulate job creation in technology in the United States? Well, the three levers that we have to stimulate job creation are number one, investments. So we, are, uh, we have $50 million in the president's budget to create and support innovation clusters. That is finding pockets of, of talent around the country that could be leveraged to bring about the jobs of the future. And uh, my hope is that regions like Silicon Valley would be well positioned for support uh, when the rules and the processes are in place for, for achieving the vision of our innovation clusters strategy. So that's a modest amount of funding, but that is a tool in the toolkit that is on the table. The second tool is that we are active, as I said, in the procurement space. So to the extent that we can be buying technologies that have a secondary effect of rewarding innovative companies and can spur job growth. Uh, when I was Secretary of Technology in Virginia, we had, uh, the year before I arrived, uh, engaged in the nation's largest IT outsourcing in, uh, uh, partnership. We signed a 10-year, nearly $2 billion contract with Northrop Grumman uh, using IT procurement, and what that had done is created about 700 technology jobs in uh, the more rural parts of the state. In fact, uh, 400 directly related to the Northrop Grumman facility and 300 to an adjacent facility by a contractor, CGI. The job creation was a, was, the, was, the, was a byproduct of an innovative public-private partnership that basically said, how do we take advantage? So, so where appropriate, we will be buying more technology and hopefully creating the market environment for, for support. Um, the third thing that I'm working on that's a little bit harder to, to see an immediate uh, turn on, but uh, I'm working very closely with the Labor Department to find ways in which we can embrace emerging technologies so that something very simple can happen. 
that every available job seeker can access every available job. And you may think that's easy, but it isn't. And so uh, we haven't formalized yet the way we're going to go about this, but my hope is that by Labor Day we'll have a strategy to reduce the friction in the marketplace so that at least we can do more to connect uh, job opportunities to individuals that are out of work. I will make one final observation. This is a cultural issue for the, go for the government. Again, drawing on my Virginia days. We have a lot of vacant positions in Washington. When I was in Virginia, we had vacant positions in our tax department, as an example. By embracing telework, the idea that you don't have to physically locate where the jobs are, our tax commissioner made the conscious decision to identify 25 job opportunities in a rural part of the state that had been hit with high unemployment. There was no building, no ribbon cutting, no fancy real estate transaction. We simply put out an ad in the paper and said, anybody who wants to work full time from home will provision for you the broadband and the infrastructure from an IT standpoint. And those workers were more productive than the workers that we had in the main line. And we also had them at a higher a retention rate. Uh, for the first year of this pilot, we saved almost $140,000 in turnover costs. So in Washington, we too want to embrace the spirit of telework. And so there may be job opportunities in Washington that can be sourced here. And we just have to be better about that methodology. So these are not easy answers to the question, but these are the modest tools that we have in my shop to uh, address it. The long-term job creation was really the heart of my responsibility, and that is making sure we've got the right policy goals for jobs of the future, investing appropriately in nano and bio in the areas that we think that could be the next wave of growth for the country. With that, let me just say thank you for your time, and I look forward to mingling at the reception and uh, meeting you again real soon.